Hey, everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by SoundWeb Studios. Visit online at SoundWebStudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. SoundWeb Studios is the answer. SoundWeb Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at SoundWebStudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also time to give official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international warring author Mia molson -Zia. If you love fast-paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia molson -Zia, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing is fast-paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is illusion and those you love will be the first to go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia molson -Zia is darn great readers and Eve Eleven endorsed by Howard celebrities, including Joanna Cassie, Forbes Riley, and Manales. So grab your copy today for Girls Missing by Me and Molson Zia, available on Amazon. Also check out the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com on over 30 podcast platforms and the themikewidenershow.com, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also Anchor FM, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Audible, Apple Music, and more. Take the Mike Widener Show with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. And follow the Mike Wagner Show on Instagram and Twitter today. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Wagner Show podcast. T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, tote bags, and a lot more. Amazon.com and check out the Mike Wagner Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash me and Molson Zia for great books like Missing, Once and Wrinkles, also T-shirts, pop sockets, phone cases, and a lot more. Amazon.com slash me and Molson Zia. Also, Support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM, as well as PayPal and the Mike Widener Show.com. Make sure you do so today. We're here with a terrific gentleman who is a PhD and a professor of emeritus at McGill University in Montreal in research in plant morphology in the development and evolution of plant form. And he has published nearly a hundred research papers and several books, including three-time award-winning um, Oregon uh, and, and Genesis of Flowers and Biophilosophy. So we'll talk more about that. And talk courses in biological plant, general and uh, philosophy, history, and the human condition, especially the plants. And, um, and, and he's also um, has a new book that warns of the dangers of placing our faith solely on scientific proof, which is called the book uh, Science and Beyond. We'll talk more about that. And uh, practices laughing meditation and of course it's um, it's uh very interesting scientific truth and a lot more and um of course you know beliefs have changed and everything else and live ladies and gentlemen from the plus studio somewhere in canada the very multi-talented and author of science and beyond towards greater uh sanity through science philosophy art and spirituality ladies and gentlemen ralph settler ralph good morning good afternoon good evening thanks for joining us today Thank you very much, Mike, for inviting me. It's well, it's, it's great to have you on board, too. So you're a PhD and, and professor of emeritus at McGill University in Montreal. You, you do your research in plant uh, morphology in the development and evolution of plants. And also you published nearly 100 uh, research papers and several books, including three-time award-winning um, you know, or Oregonogenesis of Flowers and uh, Biophilosophy. You taught courses in... Uh, biological plants and um, general philosophy, history, and a lot more. And um, you have a new book that warns the dangers of placing um, faith and solely on the scientific proof. And you also practice lapping meditation. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about your book, Science and Beyond, the Towards Greater Sanity Through Science, Philosophy, Art, and Spirituality. And before getting to all that, Rolf, tell us how you first got started. Yes, uh, well, I was very interested in writing this book because, uh, as I just told you before, I've been very interested in controversy in science. Uh, and as a student, uh, I studied at five different universities in, in Europe, in Germany, Switzerland, Austria. And what I did is I went from one professor to his opponent who had the opposite view. And uh, that was a very interesting experience because what I learned is that when I was the first one, it seemed all so evident, so clear cut, so 
proven in a way. And when I went to this, his opponent, then uh, it didn't seem so clear cut anymore. And I could see the merits also of the opposite uh, point of view. So that was a rather fundamental experience to me in my life because I could see that uh, science is not as clear cut as it is often presented. In fact, when you have a closer look, you often can find contradictions and having an awareness of these contradictions that can lead to greater, uh, better understanding. And also what I learned is that there are so many misconceptions about science. Uh, they are widespread in the general public, in governments, and also among many scientists. And uh, these misconceptions may have grave, even uh, disastrous consequences, as we could see it, for example, also during the COVID pandemic. So uh, that was one reason why I wrote the book to point out these uh, misconceptions. In fact, I have 11 chapters in my book, and in each chapter, I deal with one of these misconceptions. And the uh, grave, sometimes catastrophic uh, consequences. And what I wanted to show is that an awareness of these misconceptions can really uh, have very beneficial effects and can uh, avoid, can avoid harm, can harm and uh, well, these disasters that I, I mentioned. Mm -hmm. It also says too, in the last hundred years, we believe that the universe was static and uh, stress causes ulcer and we only use 10% of our brains, all fats are bad for you, smoking is safe, and now none of it is true. <laughs> you can just uh, give us your take on that. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, it may still be partially true to some extent, but it's certainly not, not proven because that is one of the misconceptions I deal with in my book that people, even many scientists think that science in contrast to art and to philosophy, that science can provide proof. And you hear it so often, right? Scientifically proven, scientifically proven. You're hearing these ads, right? Yeah, especially <laughs> the COVID ads, you know, scientifically yes. proven. <laughs> yes, yes. But uh, I mean, it's just not possible because science is open-ended. So if we make an observation or an ex experiment today, we cannot know whether in the future, if we repeat the same experiment, we will get the same results, right? Because we just don't know the future. <laughs> And mm -hmm. it may give the same results, it may not. And there are many instances known where it gives different results. So proof is really not attainable in science. We have to live with uncertainty uh, and uh, with an openness. And uh, if this is recognized, which unfortunately is often not the case, that can be very beneficial because if you think something is proven, well, this closes the door to further explorations. Why should you look elsewhere, right, if it's proven? But if you know that it remains uncertain, then you can look elsewhere and maybe find other evidence that confirms or disconfirms what you have found. And also, if you believe in proof, it leads to a dogmatic attitude because you think you know the truth, right? And, uh, and then people tend to become dogmatic and intolerant towards others who think differently. So I think this uh, recognition that there can be no proof in science can have very beneficial effects for individuals and our society. And I just don't understand um, why um, this is such a widespread opinion still that science can provide proof. Uh, uh, one nice example that I like to give, and I often gave in my lectures to students, uh, that shows uh, how how impossible it is to get proof, is the example of black swans. You know, in Europe, uh, for a long time, they didn't know anything about um, the black swans in Australia. They they saw only the white swans in Europe, and wow. then they 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 saw them again and again and again hundreds thousands of times and so they came to the conclusion well it's proven all swans are white right we've never, <laughs> seen, we've never seen any swan that's not white right but then go to australia 
and then you you find out that it's not true, right? So uh, I think one, even if one has uh, repeated an observation or repeated an experiment, often time it always led to the same conclusion. We can never have absolute assurance that therefore it's proven, right? And so it, it just to me, it's just puzzling and I don't understand why in, in our society, this idea that something can be proven in science is still so widespread. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems to me that the, the same science experiments have been going on for hundreds of years, and yet it comes out a different result. And I could see where you're coming from. And they think that, you know, so much has changed, society's changed, but you're right that you conduct the same thing over and over again, or like, you know, say, you know, climate change, or like, say, you know, certain cells and all that. It's like, you're always getting different results. Uh, I wouldn't say always, but often, yes, <laughs> because some some ideas have been really confirmed again and again. But as you say, very often also, uh, it led to different uh, different uh, aspects and different uh, ideas. Uh, so, uh, and if one looks at the history of science, this is also very illuminating. Then one can see how much it has changed and how. Often it has changed, even when people thought it has been, we've come now to the final uh, conclusion. And a nice example there is um, Max Planck, one of the founders of, uh, of um, quantum uh, physics, uh, quantum uh, theory. Um, when he wanted to study physics, he was told by his professors, uh, don't study physics. You are a very good violinist. Uh, nah. become, a, become a violinist because in physics, we know almost everything now. There are only a few details to fill in. Everything else is known and, and, and we have the answer. And then you know what happened. Then Max Planck really turned over. I mean, Newtonian physics, you know, and developed uh, with others, uh, quantum physics that uh, was really an enormous breakthrough and changed the situation very much. So I think one has to be really very careful when one is told, well, this has been proven, that's the final world. <laughs> there mm -hmm. is no final world in science. Right, yeah, and of course, you also say too that few scientists are open to meditation, arts, and spirituality. And uh, what, what was your number one goal to be to uh, break all that down? Well, um, I started my book uh, from the scientific perspective. And uh, if one understands science, uh, then I think one can also see the limitations of science because very often the limitations are not seen. In fact, many people think that science, if not today, sometime in the future, will give us the final truth. The truth with a capital T, mm -hmm. <laughs> absolute truth. But this is also not possible in science for a number of reasons. One reason is that, you know, science is interested in replication. We want to re replicate uh, results of experiments. And what is replicated are the generalities. So science is not interested in uniqueness. Science is not interested in, in, in why a certain flower or person or whatever is unique. Science is interested in what can be replicated and what can be replicated is not unique by <laughs> definition, right? So in other words, science omits the uniqueness it omits the uniqueness of flowers, of persons, and so on. And but but reality consists not only of what can be replicated in, in generalities, reality also includes the uniqueness. And therefore, since science doesn't deal with the uniqueness, it, it, it cannot capture everything. And the absolute truth, of course, that which is contains everything. So you see, there is something missing in, in science uh, because it cannot capture the uniqueness. And then there's still an even more profound reason why, why science cannot give us the absolute truth is it's because science uses language and logic, uh, logic also a form of language. Uh, um, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and that is limiting uh, language does not capture reality as it is. Language is like a, a map. It, it can be well compared with a map. And you know very well that 
a map, of course, shows us much of the territory, but not everything. If you have a map of California, I mean, it doesn't show you everything of California or a map. Right, of exactly. Unless uh, you're, you're, you're too nutty to do that. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that means since science uses language and, and logic, there's a lot left out. Uh, and, uh, and again, uh, reality uh, is not fully captured and therefore it does not represent the whole truth it as it represents aspects of the truth but not the whole truth not the absolute truth hmm. and that to me is very important because that if if you can recognize that science represents only aspects of truth then you can look for other aspects of truth elsewhere and other aspects of truth we can find in philosophy, in the arts, and in spirituality. And, and, and why is science uh, limited to uh, the aspects of the truth only? Why, why is science? How do you mean? Yeah, yeah. why, why is, um, you talk about the aspects of the uh, truth and everything, and then science limits it. So why would science uh, limit? You know, that's just kind of like, you know, this interesting. I mean, I love hearing about the whole truth. Don't mistake me, so. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, it's just... Uh, it's just a limitation. I mean, we can make more and more progress in science. Then we, we cannot know where this progress eventually will lead us. But as long as we do science, we will use language and, and logic. And, and that will limit us, our understanding. And therefore, there will always be a place also for philosophy, for the arts, and, mm -hmm. for, and for spirituality. And of course, when we have a spiritual or an artistic experience that that reveals something that we cannot get in science if you get deeply involved in meditation or let's say in nature and you feel like a oneness with nature that's an experience that you cannot get the same way in science if you listen to music that that moves you very, very deeply. That's also an experience, I mean, that you don't have in science the same way. So yes, science reveals certain aspects of the truth, but then we need also these other aspects. And that was, of course, also one of my major concerns in writing this book, that, uh, that we need these other aspects too. Because mm -hmm. in our society, science has become the I think one could say the dominant force and, and many people just believe that's what we need and that's the only thing we need and I think we need more than that we need also philosophy the arts and spirituality and that's a very good point we'll talk about those uh, in the book in just one minute but first listen to the Mike Widener show at the Mike show.com powered by Soundcraft Studios visit online at soundcrabstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Soundcrab Studios is the answer. Soundcrab Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. It's 1-800-303-3960 or email to support at soundcrabstudios.com. Mention to Mike Widener, show get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Widener Show, international warring author Mia Molson Zia. If you love fast paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing is fast paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is an illusion and those you love will be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson Zia has garnered great reviews. An evil love and endorsed by Howard celebrities, including Joanna Cassie, Forge Riley, and many others. So grab your copy today for Ghost Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at the Mike Show.com and over 30 podcast platforms. Take us with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter today. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, Go to amazon.com slash me and Molson Zia for great books like Missing, Once and Wrinkles, and cool merchandise and more. Amazon.com slash me and Molson Zia. Don't forget to support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM along with PayPal and the Mike Widener Show.com. Make sure you do so today. We're here with the author of the amazing book, um, Science and Beyond Toward Greater Society or, or Sanity Through Science, Philosophy, Art, and Spirituality. Ralph Settler here on the Mike Widener Show. Before we talk more about your book, like with, um, you know, rep replicability, uniqueness, logic, 
language, and a lot more, especially empiricism. How'd you first get interested in uh, plants and science? I forgot to ask you that, uh, you know, start off. Oh, I actually wanted to do my PhD in animal behavior. Uh, oh. Yes, and uh, I, I, I took lectures with a very famous uh, animal behaviorist, uh, Lawrence, Conrad Lawrence, uh, and um, I was not so impressed by him. <laughs> as a really? <laughs> yes, although he won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> But I was very impressed by a botanist uh, at the same university that was in Munich. And so it was really my supervisor that uh, sort of, uh, you know, turned me towards botany. And uh, then I well, did my PhD in plants, uh, plant morphology, plant systematics. Wow, that is amazing. What is your favorite plant? Oh, I, I have so many. I, I couldn't single you, you, out. You can, you can pick a few. It's okay. You can pick a few. <laughs> well, <laughs> or several. I, how many you like? <laughs> I, I like orchids, of course, very much. Oh, uh, the beautiful. My wife loves them. Yes. And I often visited the Alps. And the, in, the, in the Alps, you have gentians, uh, blue gentians that I like also a lot. So, uh, but uh, really, I mean, there are many, many flowers that I like. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And that is so beautiful as well, too. There's replicability, uniqueness, logic, and language. And, uh, and it's all in a book. And um, you know, one thing that really interests me is like replicability, uniqueness, and of course, logic and language, you cover that. But the one thing I like to have you talk about is uh, empiricism and just sensing. Yes, uh, empiricism, uh, that's very important because science is considered empirical. And what does that mean? It's based on facts, uh, on empir empirical facts, right? And, um, and, and evidence. Uh, and many people think that's all that we can say about science. It's, it's based on evidence, right? Mm -hmm. And that is definitely true. It's based on evidence. It's based on facts. Uh, but that's not all. Science is also based on power on the power of influential scientists, of influential organizations, of influential communities. And, uh, and that is often ignored. These influential um, people, they are often very, often more interested in their own kinds of science than in, in, in other kinds of evidence that does not support their view. And actually they often, either ignore um, contradictory evidence or they suppress it. We can see this again during the, the pandemic. Uh, um, and we have there the official narrative, right? And then we have scientists, even Nobel laureates, who have a different view based also on evidence. And that is very much ignored. Uh, so uh, so this happens very often in science and, and that is not recognized. So I, I don't want to say that power plays always a role, but I think very often plays a role and uh, sometimes a very important role. And uh, so, um, yeah, science is empirical, but science is also to a great extent um, based on power or reflects power. So uh, a French um, historian and philosopher, Michel Foucault coined the term power knowledge. Uh, power knowledge. Power knowledge. So knowledge, not based only on evidence, but also based on both evidence and power. That's very important, I think, to recognize. Mm -hmm. And very important indeed, too, of course, you know, besides with the uh, logic, language, empiricism, we talked about as well, too, uncertainty, replicability, and objectivity. There's also the mechanic, um, mechanistic, uh, materialistic science, holistic science, and uh, beyond. Mechanics are also involved as well. Yes, yes. You, you know that our mainstream science is mechanistic and materialistic. In fact, mainstream scientists think that's often think that's all there is to reality. It's all physical. It's also called physicalism. And that again is a very dominant view. And these mainstream scientists, they often suppress holistic uh, views of science that, that comprise more than just uh, matter that also emphasize very much uh, consciousness 
and um, and and other aspects. For example, we have uh, parapsychological phenomena like uh, telepathy, clairvoyance, and so on. This does not fit into a materialistic, mechanistic uh, paradigm. Uh, so what uh, these mainstream scientists often say is, well, these phenomena do not even occur because they cannot explain them well in their mm -hmm. framework. But uh, I think uh, there are many people have such experiences and furthermore a lot of science has been done on these phenomena and of course it has not been proven because nothing can be proven in science right <laughs> but still there is a lot of evidence for these phenomena and uh, and that um, that does not fit very much into mainstream science so uh, i think holistic science is very much uh, at the periphery um, one example is medicine also. Uh, mainstream medicine is still very much materialistic. I mean, if you see a doctor, he looks at your material body, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. And, ah. and he doesn't, he doesn't <laughs> ask you so much about, tongue, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't ask you so much about your feelings, emotions, or your spiritual experiences, or what have you, right? Mm -hmm. So but in the, we have al, what's often called alternative medicine, yeah, that emphasizes more the holistic aspects and that emphasizes more the non-material aspects that can also be very important for healing. I mean, there are many, many stories, you know, where people got healed through these alternative uh, um, methods, like acupuncture is something that doesn't fit very well in our mainstream thinking because the meridian there's no atomical base, anatomical basis for the meridians, the, the, mm. the power lines in, that are central in acupuncture. And yet acupuncture works in many cases, not always, but conventional medicine doesn't always work, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and then there are all sorts of other uh, alternative um, kinds of medicine, like energy medicine, like Reiki and, and homeopathy and what have you. And some of these also can be very, have been very helpful. Um, the interesting thing is that, of course, they do not always work, right? And so mainstream uh, scientists who are uh, materialistic, mechanistic, they point out then these failures in alternative medicine that's not difficult to do mm -hmm. but they they are not willing to acknowledge the failures in conventional medicine and how many failures are there how many people die of cancer right how mm -hmm. many people die of covid and so on so so i mean we need both i think and and, and of course look at the um the, the medical schools as well to crank out the doctors it's like you know it's just like, you know, go figure. It's like, where have they gone wrong? You know, that's another question. Yes. Oh, yes. I mean, and um, I think um, I have been very interested in the, in the notion of complementarity. You see, very often we think in terms either or. Uh, either this is true or it's false, either this is good or this is bad. And when it comes to medicine, either conventional or alternative. I think why not embrace both, you know? And, uh, and, and we can consider them complementary. They complement one another. And uh, this is actually a notion that has been developed in quantum physics. You know, in the 19th century, physicists, physicists uh, we're also very much still um, thinking in terms of either or. And so the debate was, is light either a wave phenomenon or a particle phenomenon? Either or, right? And then in the, at the beginning of the 20th century, the quantum physicist Niels Bohr suggested it can be both. Depending on how you look at it, it manifests either particles or as waves. And then he, he, int he introduced the complementarity principle in physics so that we, we, we do not ask either or, but we, we ask, we say both and. It can be both, manifest both as particle and also, uh, also as wave. And I think this, 
this could be should be also applied in biology in biology we for example in other sciences we still find a lot of either or thinking and of course also in society in general either or thinking like a black and or white mentality black right? and white yeah and then uh, i mean why not why not acknowledge that conventional medicine and uh, and alternative medicine are complementary complementary approaches so that we can acknowledge both conventional and uh, alternative. But mm -hmm. we are far from that, you know, because uh, alternative medicine is still not taken very seriously in the conventional field. Uh, Mm -hmm. and, and of course, you know, pharmaceuticals, you hear about the news, the money involved and everything else. And, um, you know, just to uh, sum it up just briefly as well, too. And how does science transform um, uh, us, um, you know, you know, a person and beyond to uh, create a deeper, much more happier, more uh, fulfilling life? It's like, you know, how, how can science transform um, all of us, especially with the human ego, to have a more um, deeper and fulfilling life? It's like, how, how can we accomplish this? Well, uh, first of all, I think if we if we recognize the misconceptions in in science and how much they mislead us and lead into all sorts of misery, as we could see it also during the pandemic, this already can uh, improve very much our lives and can lead to a healthier and saner life. But also, if we recognize the limitations of science and we, we recognize that there is a room for philosophy, for the arts and spirituality, that, of course, can lead to a more fulfilled, more deeply fulfilled and a, a more saner and a, a happier life. Because if you are just thinking in terms of logic, and you exclude your feelings, emotions, your spiritual experiences, and so on. This, in my opinion, cannot lead to the most fulfilled and, and happy life. So that was one of the intentions in writing my book to point out that we need these other fields and having all of that together can lead to a really more fulfilled life. And, and of course, you know, they always say laughter is the best medicine. We'll talk about that in the book. You listen to the Mike Wagner Show at the themikewagnershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Also brought to you by our official sponsor, the Mike Wagner Show, international warring author, Mia Molson's You Have Missing, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. We'll be back with author Rolf Sattler of Science and Beyond, the Towards Greater Sanity Through Science, Philosophy, Art, and Spirituality after this timeout. We're back with author Rolf Sattler of Science and Beyond here on the Mike Widener Show. He's a PhD professor of uh, emeritus at McGill University in Montreal and um, research in plant morphology and more. And you also uh, like to practice um, laughing meditations. They say laughter is the best mess. And then, um, tell, tell us about it. I'm sure we, we can all use some laughter, right? Oh, yes. Yes, it's very good. But in our society, and especially in science, we tend to be often dead serious. Uh, like at universities, there's not much room for laughter. Uh, and uh, at the end of my career, I started laughing with my students at the end, especially <laughs> during exam time, you know, when, when everything was very tense and so on. I just will start into laughter for no reason at all and laughter can be very contagious so we laughed for a few minutes or five minutes and I, this was hilarious the students felt so good <laughs> afterwards i felt so good it created also a bond you know when you laugh together and once a, a colleague of mine was teaching a next door and uh, he said oh what's going on here <laughs> too loud too much noise i said oh well we are just laughing he said, oh, are you crazy i mean i was supposed to lecture not to laugh you know <laughs> but then a few years a few years later when i saw him again he said well uh, we miss your laughter so <laughs> <laughs> So that's how it started, Mike. Uh, it started in my lectures. But then when I retired and I, 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 I came to Kingston, uh, I was associated with a yoga center. And uh, I, I found out that there is something called laughter yoga. It was, it was, <laughs> it was invented by a, 
by um, a physician uh, in in India and his wife who was a, is a yoga teacher, and uh, they just develop a simple exercises that that make us laugh. And so you 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 meet and and you laugh. Uh, you make these exercises, they laugh, and it's contagious, and this goes on for half an hour or an hour. And oh wow. And, and and I gave many many sessions, laughter yoga sessions here in Kingston, at many different places in um, for various groups, uh, including hospitals, um, prisons, what have you. And uh, most of the time, people could join in and uh, and laugh, and they felt so good afterwards. But occasionally. Uh, someone was not able to do it. And once I, I led a laughter session at the university here, and there was one professor in there, and I usually start the laughter sessions with gibberish, you know, loosen, loosening up people, just making sounds like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> that's wild, you know, <laughs> just to loosen you up. This, this professor, he walked out in disgust. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's simple like this, huh? Wow. I think every comedian should know that one. <laughs> and, and, and he missed a good session. And, uh, and I mean, I, people feel so good afterwards. And, you know, there is scientific evidence of how, how good this is for our health. Because laughter, laughing uh, uh, increases... Um, the killer cells, uh, it, um, so it boosts the immune system. Mm -hmm. Laughter reduces cortisol, which uh, is uh, in this way reduces tension and stress. And there's a whole long list of uh, beneficial effects of laughter uh, mm -hmm. uh, that have been shown scientifically. But of course, uh, one doesn't necessarily need that because uh, just having the experience and laughing for half an hour shows us even without science very clearly how much better you, we feel. And one reason why I like to do these uh, laughter sessions was not just for the people, but also for myself, because afterwards I, I felt so good. <laughs> and unfortunately, oh. now it's the pandemic where we would need it most. There's <laughs> almost no demand anymore for laughter sessions. So oh I my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know something, uh, Dr. Rolf? I'm going to call you a doctor in this one. I'm feeling better already. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you. You know what? This also made me think of a story, too, about Patch Adams that he used uh, laughter at a children's hospital. I think in, uh, oh. was it Virginia or West Virginia? And in yeah. a study that's shown that the um, that the kids actually felt better in the, um, and I guess the um, demand for medicine actually dropped in. And it actually showed that, like, um, at some of the uh, elements that that just were eliminated or just minimized. And he said that with uh, Patch Adams, yeah, laughter was the best mess and he was great at it. And I watched that movie with Robin Williams. I absolutely recommend it to everybody. Patch Adams, that was terrific. I, I, I knew him. I, I did a weekend retreat with Patch Adams. So. Oh <laughs> so, my gosh. Yeah, so I know him very well. Yeah, uh, he, it's great what he did, I think. But uh, I mean, laughter in any case is is just uh, wonderful and i think i think we need more because we have a lot of tension and we have a lot of stress in in, in our society and and laughter can release a lot of that and that's also one reason why i like jokes in fact i have jokes in my book uh, <laughs> i have them in smaller print but in each chapter i have one or two jokes because <laughs> I, I, I i think academic writing you know can also get too serious and and we should not forget and also be able to laugh about our our academic uh, pursuits and uh, and and then uh, this will be very helpful in many ways <laughs> and, and, and you know so one thing you can also do it and it's perfectly okay laugh at yourselves that's the most oh, important thing yes laugh at yourself yes <laughs> you oh, make a mistake yes. laugh at yourself <laughs> That's very important. In fact, one of the exercises in laughter yoga is laughing about yourself, and we do it like, like this, you know. Oh. <laughs> 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 Look at this. 
person you know who did these stupid mistakes, but even if you mistake, you can still laugh about it, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, oh my it's, gosh. It's, it's such a good point. Yeah, it's so good. To, oh to my goodness. I, I think everybody needs to get this book. And where can we find your book at? <laughs> of course, it's definitely a laughing matter, but it's also really good. Where can we find your book at? Well, uh, it's available at practically all major outlets. You can get it at Amazon uh, and also Barnes and Noble and uh, and so on. And it's available as a paperback and also as a, as a, um, an ebook um, in on various platforms, uh, Kindle and so on. Uh, and uh, the book, uh, the paperback costs sixteen dollars. The the ebook only one dollar. <laughs> so. Wow. Okay. That's a really good bargain too. So we'll check that out. We're here with author Rolf Sattler of Science and Beyond Towards Greater Sanity Through Science, Philosophy, Art, and Spirituality here on the Mike Wagner Show. Just a few more minutes, Rolf. I'd love to have you back on. Love to laugh with you in 2022. And, uh, <laughs> and speaking of that, what can we expect from you uh, going into the next year and beyond? Sorry? I'm, I'm sorry. What, what can we expect from you going into 2022 and beyond? Well, um... At the moment, my book came out uh, last summer, and uh, at the moment, I really make some publicity for the book. Uh, I'm giving interviews uh, like with you and, and others to make it known, you know, that uh, this book exists and that people who are interested in this sort of thing uh, uh, can get it. And uh, I think it's a very timely book because... Uh, at the moment, uh, we can see really very much how these, these misconceptions that I deal with in the book uh, uh, make us limited and make us suffer and lead to all sorts of uh, health problems, insanity and what have you. So that's what I'm doing these days. Uh, besides that, I also have a very comprehensive website on which I published actually three books or one book and two book manuscripts and many, many articles. So I'm also... I, I continue working on this uh, website. And you're certainly doing a great job as well, too, Ralph. I mean, you're totally amazing. And who do you, who do you consider your biggest influence in your career? Who influenced me the most yeah. in my career? Yeah, who, who do you consider your biggest influence in your career? <sighs> yeah, well, I mean... Uh, there are many influences. <laughs> <laughs> Some of my top professors, yeah, have influenced me very much. Uh, and um, I um, was very influenced by um, Alfred Kosipsky, um, who wrote a book uh, in 1933 called Science and Sanity. Oh, wow. Yeah, and uh, he pointed out... Uh, the limitations of language because he showed, you know, that whenever we talk, we abstract, we select some features from reality. And so much is left out when we use language. Just think of a sunset, you know, if you look at the sunset and you want to describe it through language, I mean, sure, you can say there was red and, uh, and so on and black clouds and whatever, but you cannot really represent the reality of that sunset. Uh, when you use language, there is much left out. And that's one thing I learned from Korsipsky. And that's one reason why I dedicated my book to, to Korsipsky. He died in 1950, I think. Oh, wow. Um, but, um, but I think uh, his uh, influence has been enormous. And unfortunately, he is not so well known. But uh, some of the slogans that he coined are well known. One of the best known one is, the map is not the territory. <laughs> and, I love that one. Yeah, and and if you see that language is a sort of map, you know, then of course language is not the territory that means reality. It's just an abstraction from it. So mm. that's one thing I learned from Kosipsky. I, I dedicated my book to to uh, four other people, one of them the Dalai Lama, for mm. whom I have great respect because I think um, he is one of the few spiritual leaders 
who is has been and continues to be very interested in science. In nice. Fact, he had dialogues with scientists almost every year. Wow. So he was very interested in 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 science. And you know he is a Buddhist, but in the, in Buddhism uh, there are certain doctrines too. And he said that if science, scientific evidence contradicts uh, Buddhist doctrines, then we have to change Buddhist doctrines. Mm, that's <laughs> and, a good point. That's a good yeah, point. Yeah, that's a good point. And you know how long it took in Christianity to, to, until they could accept scientific evidence for evolution, right? <laughs> for some people, there are even still problems today, right? They cannot accept the evidence. So that was one reason why I, I dedicated dedicated my book also to the Dalai Lama. And in fact, I was, I was invited uh, for his um, 60th birthday celebrations to, wow, give a, to, to, give a talk, to give a talk, yes, and the, a talk on, on science and spirituality. So that's where I met him. And, uh, and I, I, I really have this enormous uh, appreciation for him. And because of his um, appreciation of, of science. But although he recognizes the great importance of science, he also, like me, recognizes that there is something beyond science too. And yes, it is. To, yes, it is. Beyond science too. So, so for this reason, I have great respect, admiration for the Dalai Lama and I dedicated my book also to him. Oh, that's so fantastic. I mean, that was just wonderful, Rob. That's wonderful. Love it. And what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? Well, read my book. Uh, besides <laughs> <Sorry>. laughing. <laughs> <laughs> no, in general, just be critical, you know, and, and don't accept uh, uh, all the official narratives that are promulgated by powerful people, organizations and so on, have a closer look at it and listen also to people who have divergent views and, and, and look at their evidence. And because if you can look at all of that, get, that gives you a more comprehensive view and that gives you a more deeply fulfilled life. And certainly do so. You've done a great job at Rolf. I got to say that I'm still laughing about it. I feel better. <laughs> Once again, author Rolf Sattler, a PhD professor of Emeritus McGill University with his book, Science and Beyond Towards Greater Sanity Through Science, Philosophy, Art and Spirituality here on the Mike Wagner Show. Rolf, a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely amazing and looking forward to having you on in 2022 and beyond. Make sure you keep it in touch, keep us up to date. And once again, tell us about your upcoming projects, what's your website, how do people contact, where can people purchase or check out your great book? Thank you very much, Mike, for inviting me. It was a great pleasure talking to you. And it's always a special pleasure if someone can also laugh. So I think we, we had a great time. I had a great time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, great. By the way, by the way, your website, yes. <laughs> my website, the website for my book is uh, www.rolfsattler, no period in between, dot com, rolfsattler.com. And there you find more uh, details about my book. That's certainly great. Once again, Rolf, a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely amazing. Looking forward to having you again soon. Make sure you keep us up to date, keep in touch. And we definitely wish you all the best. You've got a great future and let's laugh again very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, let's laugh. Let's not forget laugh. <laughs> thank you very much.